Okay. So uh, last week we left Jesus hanging in the cross, hanging on the cross. <laughs> we, we got a, or maybe it was still in the garden. I don't know. But we're on page fifty-six in Manna and Mercy, All right. uh, and we'll spend spend the day uh, around the cross with Jesus at the crucifixion. Um, I'm glad uh, he designed this page uh, the way he did with the cross so central and um, large. It needs to loom large uh, in our thinking and in our study and in our, in our understanding of the, the story of Christ, uh, the crucifixion at the center. In a sense, the center uh, of the book and um, the, the center of that page uh, what do you notice about these crosses? Not if anything. The T's, not they're T's. T's. T shaped. Uh, good. Yeah, they're T shaped. They're not they're not the Latin cross uh, with the uh, the crossbar or the uh, with the vertical uh, extending past the crossbar. That seems to reflect some uh, 20th century archaeology and history understanding of, of, of the cross as a as a T. We know the Romans used these T-shaped crosses. Uh, the, the, the cross with the, the, ex, the extension, the vertical going past that crossbar that you and I know most commonly is, is called the Latin cross. And that really was a, a, a later religious uh, development. There are lots of different shapes uh, to crosses, of course. Do some of you, let's, uh, some of you have crosses on your walls. Uh, I, I think I've seen. Uh, in fact, behind uh, Joe, above the family picture there on the wall, are, are that, those are uh, palm crosses, right? Yes, yes. There you go. There's some, th those are Latin crosses, Latin. You shape. have good eyes. <laughs> wow. You got them all over the place. Yeah. Yep. Good. <laughs> Good. Those are from made from the palm branches. Anybody else have a cross handy that they want to hold yeah, up? And I have show? one on. Yeah. Ah, good. Is Annabelle? Annabelle. One, Annabelle. one of those that Annabelle made. Good. I, There's yeah. another one from very good. That's Annabelle yes. made too. Super. Mine are on the wall in the bedroom. The other room. Good. Good. In my office over at church, I've, there's a, a wall of of crosses. I've got my my pectoral cross, the ones I, I wear uh, hanging up. I don't wear them all the time now. There's a good one. Jan, yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, Jan, oh, that's fancy. Beautiful. Very pretty. fancy. Yes. Very pretty. Pottery barn. <laughs> pottery, pottery barn. barn. <laughs> no pottery barn. I mean Hobby Lobby. Hobby oh, Lobby. Okay. Yeah. Very Christian. Christian place. It's a Christian place. Hobby yeah. Lobby. Yeah. The, uh, of course, Today, we, we could decorate and uh, make the crosses uh, beautiful symbols of uh, our faith. Uh, in, in the original story, it is more like it is in the book, uh, a very barren, uh, a couple of old hunks of wood slapped, slapped together uh, in a T-shape and a form of execution, very brutal and uh, vicious, publicly used by the, the Roman Empire to enforce its power. We have uh, stories Josephus tells about uh, not one or two or three crosses, but uh, dozens of crosses uh, lining a road as a very public statement that uh, who's in charge here. Hmm. Uh, we tend to make our executions uh, private uh, with only a few in attendance and um, not, uh, not public spectacles. But for most of human history, an execution was a public spectacle kind of thing in order to, to make a, a very strong statement about who's in charge here, the big deals are in power. Uh, we want to spend some time uh, in the Bible. Let's, let's 
let's look at uh, Luke. You know, uh, Dan Erlander, Man in, in Man in Mercy, uses the Gospel of Luke as the, the primary text for telling the story of Jesus. It's not that the other stories aren't important, and we can talk about the contrast uh, from the stories in some, some places, but in general, he's following uh, the narrative in the Gospel of Luke. And the crucifixion story in, in the Gospel of Luke is in, in chapter 23, Luke 23. If you find Luke uh, 23, we will start at verse 20, uh, verse 20, 26. So Luke 23, verse 26. And I thought we might take take the time to read this central passage uh, through to the end of the ch of the chapter, and then go back and look at Man and Mercy. So, does somebody want to start reading? Let's say say read read the first read through thirty eight twenty six to thirty eight. I'll start. Oh, thanks, Pat. Um, the soldiers led Jesus away. As they and as they were going, they <clears throat> met a man from Cyrene named Simon, who was coming into the city from the country. They seized him, put the cross on him, and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd of people followed him. Among them were some women who were weeping and wailing for him. Jesus turned to them and said, Women of Jerusalem, don't cry for me, but for yourselves and your children. For the days are coming when people will say, how lucky are those women who never had children, who never bore babies, who never nursed them. That will be the time when people will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, hide us. For if such things as these are done, when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both of them criminals, were also let out to be put to death with Jesus. And when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified Jesus there and the two criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they are doing. They divided his clothes among themselves by throwing dice. The people stood there watching while the Jewish leaders made fun of him. He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Messiah whom God has chosen. The soldiers also made fun of him. They came up to him and offered him cheap wine and said, save yourself if you are the king of the Jews. And above him, were written these words, this is the king of the Jews. Mm. Well, did you I, say to go to 38? I did, I, did. I said up, up, up that far, so far, good. Uh, we, we get the, uh, the, the basic scene there with the, the three being crucified, the inscription over his head, and it seems like a cruel joke, uh, the Messiah, uh, the 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 chosen one of God. Here he is chosen uh, to die. And um, the first of his statements uh, from the cross, which is uh, what at 34? Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Yes. Yeah. Luke records most of the uh, more of the statements from the cross than the others and so we'll get we'll get to the others in a bit perhaps talk about uh, these others too but but while uh, while they're uh, nailing him to the cross uh, while they're mocking him uh, while they're uh, uh, abusing him verbally and physically his response is the mercy response, the yeah, the the the, the true merciful response of, of forgiveness. One of the central themes of, of this whole study, uh, the manna and mercy. Um, anything else in this passage so far that that 
strikes you or is um, uh, that we should stop and remark about? Well, it's interesting that he, he says uh, to the women, uh, you know, you, you'd be lucky if you didn't have any kids because it's uh, because the, you know, the generations to come will have, you know, uh, much to worry about and think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if he's saying, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we say, or you hear people say, oh, I wish I was never born. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's... And he, he's, he is empathizing with them about uh, what they're witnessing, uh, that, that it might be that level of emotional upset. Oh, we would, we, we could wish that we were never born uh, to see such a thing, to, to experience uh, this thing with the, we, the weeping uh, and wailing. Shall we continue at, at uh, starting at 39? Peter, you raised your hand before. Would you like to read? Sure. Thank you. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. I'm sorry, it said, do you... Do you not fear God since you are under the sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, paradise is uh, an interesting concept in the Bible because it's it's so seldom used. I mean, it might be we might think of it as a common word, uh, but it only appears here in in the, the New Testament, a little bit in the Book of Revelation, and in the Book of Daniel, and it's always a, a reference uh, to. It kind of in, emerges out of the understanding of heaven is like the restored creation, or connected to the Garden of Eden. It's like the Garden of Eden uh, made fresh again and brought back uh, to uh, life as the place of habitation for God's people. Uh, it's really an old Persian word and uh, uh, out of per perhaps coming out of uh, the Babylonian exile, the Israelites uh, learned this notion of paradise or learned to think of, of uh, heaven in, in these terms. So it's on Jesus' lips uh, from the cross. Today you will be with me in the restored Garden of Eden uh, where there is no more sin. And even your hor horrific crime, whatever it is, often thought of as thieves, two thieves, um, whatever it is, it's forgiven. Uh, yeah. And you will be with me. Not in some distant future, but today, right now. Uh, that's coming. It says it says uh, as soon as the end of this horrible day, today you will be with me uh, in paradise. How does the thief know that uh, Jesus didn't do anything? His reputation might have come before him. Yeah, he might, maybe he might have been. Yep. I mean, maybe the maybe the bystanders are are uh, talking about him. They're certainly mocking him. Yeah, for sure. About a negative. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't say say precisely how he would know, but he knows his own guilt, and it seems he seems to know the guilt of of the other man. The other guy. Yeah. Uh, the the other guy. Uh, they're all partners in uh, dying today at the at the hands of the Romans. I wonder if, if they were, were all three um, Jewish. Doesn't say that either, but that's that's per, perhaps reasonable to to be to expect. 
He does seem to know about uh, what a Messiah would be, though. Mm. Yeah. That's one indication that he's he's Jewish. He does seem to know that what, uh, because he says, are you not the Messiah? In Luke's gospel, it's the Romans who are mocking Jesus. Um, it's it's not he's not being mocked uh, by by his fellow Jews here, by the religious authorities and the leaders uh, that perhaps happened earlier at the trial. But now it's now it's just the Romans, uh, in other words, the Gentiles. I want to ask you if you can give me two chapters. Let's go. Let's read now to, to the rest of the chapter, starting at verse forty-four. I'll read again. Thank you. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw that what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the woman who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Keep going. Yeah, sure. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Yeah, very good. Uh, there's the, the whole scene, the whole crucifixion scene all the way to the bitter end uh, and his, his burial. Um, we could stop and note what Dan Erlander uh, notes uh, in his depiction of this. Along with the three crosses, what else is on the page? On 56, I'm looking at. You see the centurion. Centurion, yeah. Right? Uh, given that prominent place. Who else is in the scene that is not pictured, according to what we just read? The women. We mentioned earlier the women, yes. The, the, the women uh, uh, along the way and, and uh, standing aside. The women are, are present at the crucifixion, and they see where his body is laid. Who's not present? The men. Disciples. The other disciples, the male, the male disciples, right? The, the 12. Um, where are they? Hiding somewhere. They've all run away. Jesus had predicted that they, that they would abandon him. And uh, had even said to Peter that he would deny him. That story told earlier in chapter 22, the, the denial of Peter in the, at, at the trial of Jesus. But it wasn't just Peter. Uh, they all uh, ran away uh, from the Garden of Eden on. They're not to be, not to be found. They'll come back in the story after the resurrection, but Taking center place uh, will be the, the place of the women 
as the disciples uh, of Jesus. And we had noted this earlier in the study that uh, Luke seems to use the word disciple to mean more than just the 12, but a much larger group, including women, uh, including here it says the women who had followed him from Galilee. But now turn to the, to the centurion uh, a bit. And what do we know about him? I, I don't like think. He's... Go ahead. I, I think uh, he's uh, somewhat awed, and uh, and I think he he uh, he kind of gets a a conversion right there. I mean, uh, at least uh, a, an awareness of, hey, what the hell? What, what the heck did we do? <laughs> Sorry, what the heck did we do? Yes, yes, yeah. What did we do here? Right. What does he seem to be responding to? Uh, the, the weather and uh, I mean, what's happened with the, uh, the darkness and, uh, and the, you know. Right. What time of day is it? It's the sixth to the ninth hour, uh, Peter read. But what else? Yes. What, what is that? Three in the afternoon. afternoon. That's, that's, that's noon till three. Yeah. You might say the hottest, uh, brightest uh, time of the day. But the Bible's clear. It says darkness uh, covers over, over the whole land. So, yeah, there's the, the whole cosmos is involved in this scene. So the, the centurion uh, might certainly be reacting to that. Anything else? Yeah, I think he's, he's reacting to Jesus' comments from the cross. Good. And, 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 and those comments are, Father, forgive them. And what else? Into your hands I commit my spirit. Yep. Yep. And maybe maybe even the his word to that other thief. Yeah, the exchange. Also yeah. being put to dead. Put, being put to death by that same Roman centurion and by the same Roman guard. Uh, truly, truly, you will be with me in paradise. I mean, these are remarkable kinds of statements. Uh, what we don't have here, Jesus is not crying out from the cross uh, about the uh, being abandoned, right? Right. Right. What do, what doesn't he say in Luke's gospel? I, we could talk about uh, the, the other words from the cross typ typically um, in people's mind or, or memory uh, from the other gospels that Luke omits. Anybody remember any of those? Yeah, it says, uh, Father, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? My, my God, my God, why have, why have you for? <laughs> he doesn't say that here. He, he doesn't cry out uh, mm -hmm. that he's being abandoned or forsaken. Uh, by God. That's one of them. That one, by the way, is uh, in, in both Matthew and Mark. And we know that Luke knew the gospel of Mark, or, or we, we certainly believe that, that he's following the gospel of Mark through the basic story. So he's made a decision, Luke has, the author of Luke's gospel has made a decision to omit that word. Somehow it doesn't fit uh, in, in what what Luke wants to present at the, at the scene of the crucifixion, the abandonment piece, my God, my God. What other word from the cross? Anybody remember any of them? I think about the thirst. thirst. I thirst, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. And, and where does that appear? That's not in Luke, but, but it is in, Matthew. pardon? In Matthew, they talk about giving the, um, giving him the, uh, the sponge to drink, whether they're going to, you know, the sour wine. Yes, and also the Gospel of John, right? Yeah. That's in, in, in John, I'm, th I'm thirsty. And they, yeah. they, they offer him uh, sour wine to drink. Yeah. Any other statements? Uh, John's Gospel has a little scene where Jesus talks to the beloved disciple and his mother who are at the foot of oh, the yeah, cross. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, uh, see, now this is your mother and son, this, uh, yeah, son, this is your mother 
and mother, this is your son now. He's making provision for them yeah, that the she might guys. be cared for because uh, Joseph is no longer in the picture and the eldest of the son is no longer going to be in the picture. So he's providing for his mother uh, here. Um, perhaps Luke omitted that. Maybe he didn't know that tradition or perhaps he omitted it because uh, he doesn't want uh, the focus uh, to be taken off Jesus uh, there on the cross uh, to uh, these others who would be uh, uh, present. I, I already said that all the men had run away, so why would John be there? Mm. In other words, it just brings up other kinds of questions. Uh, but John's gospel does include that with, with kind of touching, it's very touching uh, uh, scene. Yes, go ahead, Joe. Uh, he, he doesn't say uh, it is finished in this either. And he does not say it is finished. He doesn't right. say he's finished. Um, but the other reason why I think the disciples left, I mean, let's, let's look at the, the history there. I mean, I think the men have the most to lose by being around there because, you know, you're guilty by association. And I have a feeling that they said, hey, we, we, you know, we better, better get out of here because, you know, uh, they're going to think we're in on this. The women, I don't know with the position of women back then, if, if the Romans ever considered them a threat. I mean, I, you know, I mean, they're not really a, I mean, they, you know, I, I don't want to say the position was not really a, a high one no. of being female back then. I mean, that, uh, right. correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, no, the yeah, men have the most to lose. So they're saving their butts to, to get out of the way. Exactly. I mean, many of the scenes, I don't even mention the women that are there because they, right. right. they count them as being people. It, you might, yeah, you might understand it, their weakness there. So. In, in some ways, you might, you're, you're, you're saying that it's almost safer for the women to be there. Right. It's riskier for the men uh, to oh, be there. Oh, sure. Uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that the men are to be commended for that uh, <laughs> be, because they are, um, they're in a sense giving into their fears, right? Oh, well, sure. Yep. Yeah. I mean, they, they had been following Jesus and they had boasted even, Peter had boasted, I will go with you to the death. Yeah. Almost within the next couple of paragraphs, uh, he's violating that oath. Uh, and he's giving giving into his fear. So his fears um, have become stronger than his faith uh, right. at that point. Right. right. Un until they get the Holy Spirit, then they then they feel less. I think. Mm -hmm. And they more but, feel. Um, yeah. But would would uh, could they have uh, had that spirit earlier uh, by being? Uh, uh, Faithful to a vow and, and to a promise. And, and what would it, what would it have looked like if they had been arrested and then the Romans grab a fourth cross and up goes Peter? Um, would Peter die then feeling abandoned, or would he feel would he feel um, that he too is with Jesus in suffering, mm -hmm. and then today you will be with me in paradise? What kind of impact would have that would that have had uh, on the centurion to watch uh, a man willing to die uh, with his friend? Also, could have been a power could have been a powerful scene. But Peter is uh, is not present. Well, it's also they didn't until the resurrection. They still didn't get it. A lot of them, they were still not sure exactly what was going on. Yes, and, and as we'll see next week, uh, even after the resurrection, yeah. uh, <laughs> that, that they're not getting, not quite. Right. Um, so they thought, oh man, doubted, over. Yeah. we got to save our own behinds. <laughs> right. What, what I always, uh, I always like the story of the centurion and not just here, but to me, uh, when they mention a centurion, a guy in the Roman army who's got tremendous power. I mean, he may be a foot soldier, but he's still way up there. And to have a person like that 
with all this power behind them to be converted, much like when the sick, his sick servant, he says, don't even, Jesus, don't even come to my house. You know, just say the word. To me, that's a miracle. Uh, it, you know, to, to see that can kind of conversion or that kind of faith. And I, I, I can, that's one of my favorite stories, both yep. this one and the other one. Yep. Do you remember uh, the actor Ernest Borgnine? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what was he? He was uh, in, oh, he's in a lot of famous movies. Uh, uh, but he, he, he played the centurion. Did it? Oh, wow. In uh, a story of the crucifixion. Was that in uh, the greatest story ever told, perhaps? Or? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. He played the centurion. And there is a famous story about uh, Ernest Borgnine himself when he got to that part and had to say that line. It was very emotional for him. It was a, it was a, a really powerful spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. He had wow. he had uh, grown up with with some faith, but it was in doing that part that he really uh, you know, became attracted again to uh, the Christian faith and the power of this story, uh, the power of Christ, by trying to get into the part, get into the the emotion of of the scene. If you turn to Manna and Mercy to page eighty nine, um, the centurion is explained or explored a little bit there on page 89. This is in the, the kind of the footnotes or the end notes of, of the book. In the right-hand column under 56, under, under the second, uh, in the second paragraph there, yeah. I'll just read it. It says here on this note, the Roman centurion leader of 100 soldiers yeah. is wooed by the innocent suffering of the righteous one. He is the beginning of the dream of Micah, Micah 4. And we'll take a look at that in a minute. And the, pro and the promise to Abraham and Sarah, Genesis 12, coming true. He begins the procession of the nations coming to the light, as told in Isaiah 60. On the cross, Jesus is Israel, the true remnant. He fulfills the purpose of Israel to woo the nations to Zion. Uh, and then it says, uh, look at page 6 and, and 26. Uh, so what I want to do is actually look at, at, at this Micah passage and, um, and the, some of the other things referenced uh, in this paragraph, because we want to understand this idea of uh, being wooed uh, by the love of God, uh, which is not to say God snaps his fingers and salvation comes to the world or overpowering um, with military might or over, overpowering with logic or reason. This is God wooing the world toward the manna and mercy way with um, the power of innocent suffering and, and the promise that uh, something that God is up to something marvelous, wonderful. Uh, uh, Joe's word was miraculous, but this was a miracle happening. Uh, I agree. Can anybody turn to find Micah chapter four? This is the, this is a one way to tie an Old Testament prophecy or vision. Yeah. from hundreds of years before Jesus hundreds, hundreds. To, to what uh, is going on uh, in, in the cross of Christ. It's Micah 4, 1 to, 1 to 4. All of it. In days Thank to you. come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised up above the hills. Peoples shall stream to it and many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. 
Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they should all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Okay, so what is it that we're, that we're what's the connections here to the, this passage? Here we see here at the crucifixion of Jesus, we've got this centurion who is hand holding a sword, right? And that's uh, noted in verse three there. They shall uh, about strong nations, uh, they shall beat their swords. And here, here this, uh, this Roman soldier holding a sword, where is he standing? On a mountain, we call it Mount Calvary. Uh, this the prophet's vision is the nations will stream to the mountain of the Lord, and out of this mountain, the Temple Mount, Jerusalem, here it's called Zion, shall go forth instruction, the word of the Lord uh, from Jerusalem. And he's hearing Jesus say these gentle words of forgiveness and of um, mercy to the, uh, the, the thief that's hanging next to him. And all the power of the world, it seems, is there present in the symbol of, of the centurion and his sword. But uh, here, the, the, the vision is all of that gets upended when God speaks uh, this simple different way of power, the way of forgiveness, the way of, um, of mercy. For the mouth of the Lord host has spoken. Can you imagine this centurion? I mean, he doesn't know this passage from Micah, perhaps. Uh, but can you see how... Uh, what might be going through his heart and his mind here that everything he's always been been taught about power and power the powerful in the world is uh, in a sense called into question uh, by what's happening right in front of him and we interpret it or uh, the early church interpreted it through these old prophets um, that so that's that's the Micah passage that is noted in in the in the footnotes. The other is, is Genesis 12, verse 3. And I know you could find that really quickly, but I'll just, I'll just read it for you. Genesis 12, verse 3 is uh, the promise to Abraham and Sarah from God that they would be the beginning of uh, a great people. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's a lot of cursing going on right there at the scene at, of the crucifixion. Uh, but the curses are turned uh, into, in a sense, into, into blessing. Uh, as this soldier comes to realize that he somehow is included in the great mercy of God. That it's not just a Jewish thing and a and we Romans are all so much more powerful than any of the, any of that. No, this soldier now uh, has this. Joe's word was conversion, uh, uh, a conversion experience. Uh, I think it, it, it's a it's a remarkable note um, to tie what's happening with the centurion from Luke's perspective. Uh, he's got in mind all of this stuff from the Old Testament. The promise of, of blessing. Um, one more. At the end of that note, it says, also see Luke 2, verse 29 to 32. And what is that? That's the other end of the story of Luke. We were in chapter 23. Now we're going all the way back to Luke chapter 2. What, what's at Luke chapter 2 that might, might be of, of significance here? This is just after, after the birth of Jesus, the wonderful story of Jesus born in the manger, 
and the shepherds and the angels. And then on the eighth day, Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple, the baby to the temple. Where, what happens there? They meet Simeon and Anna, two elderly Jewish people that hang, who hang around the temple looking for the promised Messiah. And when the baby Jesus comes in, they recognize him as, oh, this is the promise. This is the, the, the fulfillment come through. And, and Luke uh, has Simeon kind of bursting out into song. This is Luke the musical. <laughs> right? Here's a little bit Broadway song right in the midst of, <laughs> of the, the early story. Luke 2, verse 29 to 32. Master or Lord, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your. Simeon is saying, I can die a happy man now. God's promise has been fulfilled. I have seen the Messiah. I can die uh, in peace because Simeon had been promised that he would not die until he saw the Messiah come. Lord, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word, your promise is being fulfilled. For my eyes, my own eyes, have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles. It's not just for the Jews, but it's even for Gentiles, centurion folks. And for the glory of your people, Israel. Uh, I think it's a remarkable thing to tie this passage from old Simeon in Luke 2 to the crucifixion scene. What if you put the words of Simeon's song in the mouth of the centurion? Mm -hmm. What is he? I, I think. I think if you put the the words of Simeon's song in the heart and the mind and the, even the mouth of the centurion, you get a sense of the power of what he is experiencing here. That he has seen the salvation of God, of of God. He has seen the Messiah, the innocent suffering one. Uh, and all of that is, is, comes out when, when the centurion sees what he sees and he says, truly this man was innocent. Because innocent people are not supposed to be strung up uh, on a cross and die with the dignity and the, um, the emotional power and the forgiveness uh, that Jesus proclaims. Imagine that the, it's a centurion saying something like this, Lord, now you are dismissing your servant, me, this centurion who think I had it all, I'm at the pinnacle of power, I'm at the top of the world. You dismiss me now in, in peace, for my own eyes have seen your salvation which you've prepared in the presence of all the peoples, a light for revelation even to us Gentiles and glory for your people Israel. Uh, we sing, this is called, this song of Simeon is called the, um, the Nunc Dimittis and it's, it's in, in the church's worship life, it, it came down to be sung uh, at uh, evening prayer, uh, every evening. Uh, in the monastic tradition, they would sing this. They'd sing this uh, song every day. Uh, and in a sense, they're saying it, uh, Lord, now you can dismiss us in peace at, at night because we too have lived with a vision of the Messiah in our hearts and in our minds uh, through this day. It's been a light for us. Now dismiss us in peace. It's kind of like... Uh, now I lay me down to sleep. Right. I mm. pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's it's that kind of prayer. Wasn't it in the um I don't know if it was setting too, it was in the LBW setting. This this was included in the worship. I remember growing up singing it. I remember singing this or I at yes, some yes. Oh yes. Uh yes. Oh, good. Uh, we we, all, we we also sang it um sometimes saying it after communion at the end of the service after communion uh, um, lord now let you let your servant go in peace your word has been fulfilled we have been blessed uh with 
the, the gifts of Holy Communion. So it's a sending song mm -hmm. for us. You dismiss us. Uh, for, I've often uh, tried to use it uh, at funerals as well, because it can be a powerful song there too, um, that somebody has died uh, in peace and, you, and, we, and we proclaim that they have been uh, are dismissed now, uh, having f God fulfilling his promise. Uh, for a life faithfully lived and now uh, with the hope of resurrection in their hearts. Um, the Nuke de Minutes, a powerful song, and it comes out of this, uh, the Gospel of Luke. I think it's a, a, a brilliant, I had never thought of it before to tie it to the crucifixion, but uh, Dan Ernlander has helped us see that in this, in this scene, in the, in the words of the, the Roman centurion. Um, let's see, I'm also on that. Oh, if you if you were happen to be back at page eighty nine, one more little piece there, and then we'll take a look at a video. Uh, at the bottom of eighty nine, in that note section, you see there's yeah. a the, the box and it's called the Primal Story. Mm -hmm. Right. Point that out too. The Primal Story of the New Testament. Somebody care to just read that box for us? It's, a, it's an important piece in this whole man and mercy study. All right, I'll read. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, okay. The story of death and resurrection, re resurrection of Jesus is the primal story in the New Testament. Every other part is understood in light of this event. This journey of Jesus through death to resurrection gives the followers of Jesus their identity, their understanding of God, and their understanding of life and how to live. Followers of Jesus participate in the primal story, story through baptism. In this water ritual, they die with the Messiah and they are raised with the Messiah to new life. To participate in the new order, which Jews call Jesus. the reign, Jesus calls the reign of God. Yeah, the reign of God or the kingdom of God. Yes, classes. kingdom of God is here. Yeah. Uh, it's Romans 6 that, that ties it to baptism for us so that we, we are at the crucifixion or we are part of the crucifixion. We die with Christ in Holy Spirit. So we're drowned in the waters and then we come up out of the waters in resurrection uh, hope. That's the, uh, the power of the symbol of, of baptism for us. Erlander calls this the, the crucifixion and resurrection is the primal story. Um, I, earlier today, I said the crucifixion is at the center of it all, the center uh, of the, the New Testament story or the biblical story of Christ. If it's the primal story of the New Testament, what does that make you think of or suggest? Here is the primal story of the New Testament. The fulfillment of the Old Testament. Yes, there's also a primal story in the Old Testament. What is the primal story in the Old Testament? Well, we got a box on page 89. If you go back to page 79, you'll see a similar box <laughs> called the primal story of the Hebrew Bible or the primal story of the Old Testament. And what do you imagine it is? What is that primal the story? Exodus. The it Exodus. It is the Exodus. Yes, it's this other story of salvation. Now, here's why this is so, so important to think of it in these kinds of terms, to link these primal stories. Because the we should think of, learn to think of the Exodus as the great story narrative of the Old Testament. It is like a death and resurrection. What we come to think of as the death and resurrection of Christ as the, the story of salvation. For the Hebrew Bible, for the Jews, for us uh, as descendants of the Jews, the Exodus is that story of salvation. It is a story of death and resurrection. There's a lot of death in the, the story of the Exodus. And uh, the Israelites being saved from slavery, slave, saved from a, a life that was just like death, being enslaved all your life, and being resurrected, brought to a new land, brought to new life. 
the power of the resurrection is all over the Exodus. They even come through the waters. You know, they 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 yeah. they go through the sea. Uh, what we just said about baptism is connected mm -hmm. to this uh, too. That we go through the waters, and so all of these themes are wonder wonderfully uh, symbolically tied together. The primal story of the Old Testament is the Exodus. The primal story of the New Testament is the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. And we participate in all of it. When we say something is primal, it is something like deeply embedded in the human experience into the prime uh, um, creation piece um, of, of who we are uh, as people. It's part of something primitive uh, about us, about each of us. These primal, primal narratives describe the human existence and, and the human life. Say, shall we um, take a look at the, at the video? Uh, and the video today is called uh, Tom's Story. And it connects to that word from the cross, Father, uh, forgive them. Uh, Everyone see this? I see it. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Pastor Rebecca. My name is Tom Dooley. For many years, I've been involved in prison ministry. And one aspect of that prison ministry is to work with men on death row. I'm a part of a team that has made a commitment to the men that we work with that they will not have to face their executions alone. We will stay with them and with their families all the way through to the time of their execution. As a result of that, I met a man named Billy. Billy was uh, a man who came to prison that 20 plus years before I met him. And as I got to know him, he told us that uh, he had been in prison for a horrible deed, which he never denied doing. He always took responsibility for it. But when he got to prison, he was angry, bitter, broken, as you might imagine. And for many years, he stayed in that anger and that bitterness and basically just lived in his cell by himself until the time came when the Holy Spirit uh, broke into Billy's life in a real and powerful way, and to make a long story short, changed his life forever. From then on, Billy lived as a faithful Christian, attendant to the things of the Christian faith, and as a result, he grew in the Christian faith. We spent the last week of his life with him prior to his execution, and we spent the last day of his life with him as well. In Alabama, you do get a final meal, and that meal is usually served about three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, Billy had made his request for his meal, and the warden had gone to get the meal for him. And at about three o'clock, the warden came in with the meal. There were 10 men on the team, plus Billy, who'd been visiting all day long. And when the warden came in, it was very apparent that Billy and the warden had a pretty good relationship. They began to joke and tease with one another. And I thought this was interesting because in Alabama, the warden is the executioner. The warden is the one who starts the process of the lethal injection, and he is the one who is responsible for seeing to it that the prisoner is executed. And so this banter went on for a few minutes, and then the warden turned to go. And as he turned to go, Billy reached out his hand and caught the warden on the arm and said, could you wait just a few moments before you go? I'd like to pray for you. And the warden said, yes, that would be fine. And so he stopped and waited, and when he did, Billy instructed the rest of us to stand up. We stood up. He instructed us to join hands, which we did. And when we joined hands, Billy began to pray. 
and he prayed simply the most beautiful prayer I've ever heard in my life, I think, given the circumstances. It was a prayer of blessing for the warden and for his family. It was a prayer asking for God's care upon him and what he had to do. And it was just an amazing, amazing scene. Of course, when that happened, the first thing I thought about was Jesus from the cross uttering the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To bring that line of Christ uh, into our world, into uh, a modern day scene of uh, forgiveness and uh, even at a trial, at an execution. Uh, powerful, powerful testimony. We don't leave Jesus uh, on the cross uh, this week. Uh, we leave him uh, buried in a borrowed tomb uh, from Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, when we turn the page to chapter 13 next week, um, we'll find the women. Remember all the men, have, they're off in hiding somewhere. Uh, we find the women uh, outside that tomb, but the joy of Easter uh, is come. Uh, that's our study for today. Uh, Thank you for joining us at Manna and Mercy. Will we go on to the next chapter? <laughs> next, next week, we're going to uh, 